All right, we'll wait a minute or two to get started. Uh, Professor Small, hmm? um, in the in the multi-layer films uh, Python notebook, yeah, you've got define TA two hundred five, and then it says this function computes the refractive index of silicon dioxide. Oh, and then the the silicon dioxide one says that it computes the other thing. Okay, um, so I'm looking at them. You're right, I do have a typo in there. And here's how I know that the function name is correct and the function uh, description is wrong. The function name, um, let's see here. If I look down here, it returns a higher index for TA205 and a lower index for SiO2. And indeed, silicon dioxide does have a lower refractive index than tantalum pentoxide. So thanks for catching that. I'll save that and good. Anything else about that while we wait for a few more people to log in? Do you know where the default install directory for uh, Anaconda and Spider is? The default directory that they're installed to? Probably yeah. under program files x86. Okay. But they should show up under the uh, start menu if you're using Windows. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, I'm... Anaconda installs under um, your folder in the users section. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm trying to get it to just pull up and open that file. And uh, it's, it's been quite interesting. Yeah, you can, um, there's a certain file somewhere in your Anaconda stuff that you can edit and change the default directory, but I've forgotten where it is. Shouldn't be too hard to find if you just Google it though. Yeah, I'm actually still learning Spider. I was using Canopy until very recently, but Canopy is no longer being supported and so. I figured for class, class, I should switch to Spider, which I prefer among the options in Anaconda, just because it looks like MATLAB. Yeah, I know Dr. Binder is using Anaconda for computational, but I think uh -huh. that's just because it's the most popular among the Astro community. Within Anaconda, does she use Jupyter or uh, Spider or what? Uh, Jupyter Notebooks. All right, we'll wait for one or two more people to show up. Okay, I got it. Now, as much as I like Python, I have heard good things about Julia. And I'm thinking that maybe this summer, in order to procrastinate from doing something more urgent, I'll teach myself Julia. But uh, 
We'll see if that happens. Maybe I'll do something that's more urgent to procrastinate from learning Julia. I'm not quite sure which way that will go. All right, let's get started. So what we're gonna be doing for the next few classes is we're gonna be talking about thin films. And by the way, the reason why these, num these notes are numbered the way they are is that for the first day of this, we're basically gonna be doing what I did in 2530. Since 2530 isn't a prereq for this class, I'm not going to assume a detailed recollection of 2530. So we're gonna be talking about the interference of light from a thin film. What happens when light comes in, some of it bounces off the top layer and goes right back into the air. Some of it goes through a thin layer of something. And what goes through the thin layer of something, of course, some of it will get transmitted, but some of it will reflect here. And then we've got waves that took two different paths, straight off the top surface and making a round trip through the material, and they interfere. And we know from experience that when this happens, we get bright colors. We see those reflection colors on soap bubbles. We see them on uh, oil slicks. If you have glasses with an anti-reflection coating, even though an anti-reflection coating is supposed to block reflection, and it does if you're looking at normal incidents, if you look at your glasses at off-normal incidents, you might notice some reflection colors there. And of course, these things are very useful because you can set them up so that they um, block reflection. Um, here's a piece of glass. Um, here's two pieces of glass, one with and one without an anti-reflection coating. And the basic idea is that these two paths are interfering destructively. Here's what happens if you uh, have or don't have anti-reflection coatings on a lens. If you've got something really bright in the field of view, when that light uh, hits the camera, it can bounce back and forth inside the lens rather than just going straight through the lens. Uh, remember, you're thinking, wait, doesn't light change uh, direction when it's inside the lens? Yes, it gets refracted, but it's not supposed to also get reflected. But if the light bounces back and forth inside the lens, then you can get halos around things. Whereas if the light just gets, goes straight through, you don't see those halos. And people can engineer these coatings to uh, block reflection over all sorts of wavelength bands. Here's something from the Edmund Optics catalog. And depending on how they design the filter, the material or materials that they choose, the layer thickness or layer thicknesses that they choose, you can get all sorts of different spectra. Uh, there is no such thing as a perfect anti-reflection coating at all wavelengths, but you can have anti-reflection coatings that block light at a designated range of wavelengths. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how they design for that. Um, we're not going to, we'll show it next time, but instead of deciding to block light at certain wavelengths, you can also use interference to make highly efficient mirrors. And so we'll talk about some of that. And one of your assignments will be to design what we call one of those mirrors, what we call a distributed Bragg reflector. All right, so basic idea, incident light. First reflection, some fraction if it gets reflected here. There's transmitted light. Of that transmitted light, well, all of it's gonna go this far. Now, some of it will go off to the right, but some of it will get reflected here. And what gets reflected here will come out and interfere constructively or destructively or somewhere in between with the first reflection. Now, there's also additional reflections. There's a third reflection that goes like this. And of that light, when it gets to this interface, some will go through and some will go this way. And of the light that goes back to there, there's a fourth reflection and so forth. And we could deal with the effects of that. I can actually show you later how we deal with the effects of that. But the vast majority of the physics that you need in order to at least make a qualitative prediction just comes from considering this first reflection and this second reflection. And you can get tremendously accurate um, predictions just from considering those two reflections. In fact, we can even show, as we will later, for an anti-reflection coating, that 
if you um, were to pretend that the transmission, let's put it this way, if you were to make a really simplified calculation and approximate this transmission coefficient as one, even though it can't be exactly one, and then you were to approximate this transmission coefficient as one, you would get the same answer that you would get if you took into account the fact that this reflection, this, sorry, transmission coefficient is not quite one, and this reflection, co and then there are other reflections here. And if you took all of those effects into account, you'd get the exact same answer. And we can understand the, um, the interference effect by thinking of the second reflection as an echo heard on top of a more recent sound, if we were talking about sound waves instead of light waves, all right? Here's the immediate reflection. Here's the echo of sound that came earlier or light that came earlier or whatever kind of wave that came earlier. And when they add up, if their peaks match up with the other peaks and the troughs match up with the other troughs, you get constructive interference. And if the troughs match up with the peaks and vice versa, you get destructive interference. Any questions so far? Okay, but there are a few complications. First of all, the wavelength in the coating is not the wavelength in vacuum. So if we want destructive interference, half cycle, inter half cycle of difference, we can't just say that the coating thickness or two times the coating thickness, the round trip distance is lambda over two. Instead, we have to set it equal, set the round trip distance, 2D equal to one half of lambda over N. Second complication, more profound than the first. When the waves reflect off of a higher index medium, then they get an extra half cycle phase shift. So if I've got a wave coming in here, we've got this refractive index is one, it's air. This is 1.38, it's magnesium fluoride. It's a very common coating to put on glass. And this is roughly 1.5, it's some kind of glass. Then if the reflection, if, sorry, if the incident light were to hit the top surface at its peak, the reflection would come off at its trough. That's not true if it started off at a high index medium and reflected off a low index medium but it is true if it starts off in a low index and reflects off a high index. So if this is coming in at its peak and reflecting at its trough, there's no reason why it always has to be that, I'm just doing it that way because it's easier to draw, then this round trip had better come out at its peak, all right? And if the round trip comes out at its peak, well, let's think about this a little bit. The round trip wave, um, does it, get ref does it get flipped upside down and when it reflects here? Any guesses? Yeah. yeah, because here it's reflected off of a higher index medium. It's in a medium with 1.38 index. It's reflecting off of a medium with 1.5 index. So it's going to get flipped. So that's a half cycle. You could think of a flip as a half cycle. So... If we want, if this came in at its peak, and we want it to come out at its peak, we want it to go through a full cycle in here. Now it's getting half a cycle from the reflection there, which means it has to get its other half cycle from the distance covered. So we could say that the second reflection has the following phase shifts. There's a half cycle due to the uh, reflection here. There's 2D divided by the wavelength in the medium or the round trip distance divided by the wavelength in the medium. That's the total phase shift of this wave. The first reflection gets a half cycle phase shift. And the difference between those two has to either be a half cycle or one and a half cycles or two and a half or three and a half or so forth. Because if the different, because there's no physical difference between a half cycle and one and a half cycle. So we're going to write that difference as one half plus an integer. And we set that equal to 2N2D over lambda, and we can solve for the film thickness. Any questions on what I did there? 
All right. Now, what if we wanted constructive interference? Because maybe instead of designing an anti-reflection coating, we are trying to design, I don't know, one of those colorful foils on wrapping paper. Have you ever seen wrapping paper or ribbons uh, that look like different colors from different angles? People deliberately design for that. Well, then we would have to take this phase shift of the second reflection, subtract off the phase shift of the first reflection, and set that difference equal to an integer. And we get another prediction here. Alternately, if someone told you what the thickness was and asked you to predict which wavelengths would reflect strongly, well, then we do this. So the basic idea is that you get strong reflection if you can fit an integer number of half wavelengths inside the coding. Any questions? Yeah, actually, um, real quick. This is more actually from the last slide, but um, so you said when the, when the wave was coming out, it was at its peak, and when the wave was going in, it was at its peak. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. Okay. And so at the first reflection incidence, it got its flip, so it was going to be at a trough um, for that well, first oh, reflection. Well, wait, wait, wait. Remember, it's also oscillated while going through here. Correct. What I'm saying is in the first reflection, so if we look at the first, oh, reflection, the first reflection versus the second yeah, yeah. reflection, then yeah. it's trough versus peak, so we consider that to be destructive. Um, yeah, this is this is at its trough. It's coming out at its peak, so okay. it will interfere destructively. Okay, cool. And so then in the next one. Okay, cool. I, I got it. Thank you. All right. Okay. So now let's uh let's try deriving a formula for the wavelengths to get strong reflection if instead of having a low medium high we have low high medium and this can happen if we have oil on water now when you look at homework problems with oil and water or textbook examples with oil and water there's no one thing that's oil there are many kinds of oil basically anything that's hydrophobic and viscous and organic and less dense than water, someone's probably calling it oil. Um, but I find many different materials, sorry, many different liquids with many different wavelengths called oil. So try on your own to figure out what the uh, wavelength should be or what's a formula that would relate the wavelength lambda to the thickness, D, if we have this scenario. I'll give you a minute or two to think about that, and then we'll discuss. All right, so here's how I would do it. I would say we've got a half cycle phase shift here. In this round trip, there's no phase shift due to reflection there because it's in a high index medium reflecting off of a low index medium. So the only, wave, the only phase shift that's going to be experienced 
inside this uh, medium is due to the round trip distance, two times the thickness over lambda over n. So that's what we get. 2n2d over lambda is m plus a half. Lambda is 2n2d over m plus a half. Now let's say that the thickness is a micron. That's a plausible enough thickness for an oil slick on water. We start plugging in numbers. We get many, many wavelengths that will undergo constructive interference from reflection. Most of these are not visible. You might have to go to high values of M before you get something. If we were to look at a reflectance spectrum, just by knowing the positions of the peaks and the troughs, we can work out the approximate shape of it. It's worth noting that we're rarely going to get zero reflectance at the minimum unless this reflection and this reflection and all the others exactly cancel. We'll say more about that in a little bit, but getting exact cancellation requires some very special circumstances. Now, another way to interpret these formulas is that we keep getting 2n2d over lambda either equals m or m plus a half, depending on whether we're looking for constructive or destructive interference, and also depending on how many reflection phase shifts we had, because each reflection phase shift is going to give you an extra term with a half. If we multiply both sides by 2 pi, then we've got 2 pi n2 over lambda. That's n k naught. And we got the 2d, that's the round trip distance, and that's equal to 2 pi m, which is just or pi plus 2 pi m, which is either an integer number of cycles in radians, because remember that for a sinusoidal function, you go through one cycle when the input to that sinusoidal function changes from 0 to 2 pi, or 2 pi to 4 pi, or 4 pi to 6 pi, etc. All right. Um, any questions? We could do the same thing here. Um, we could have water, oil, air, and really it's just the same scenario. I changed the refractive index a little bit. The context has shifted in that now the light is starting out in water, but well, one thing is that you could be underwater and be shining a flashlight, or you could be a bioluminescent organism like a jellyfish or whatever. Um, another context is that uh, people often put high index oil on top of a specimen, the biological specimen, its tissue is going to have an index close to water. You put a high index oil on top of it to collect the light, get a higher numerical aperture, and then you have air. And it would be the exact same problem again. This phase shift will be 2n2d over lambda. There is no reflection phase shift there. This will be a half cycle. And we get the same uh, formula again. Now, if we wanted destructive interference, we would set 2n2d over lambda minus a half equal to m plus a half. And we would get this formula. And now we've got m plus one in the denominator. And here's the, the subtle thing. Is zero an allowed value of m? Well, that, that depends. Um, it could be um, in that if we put zero in for m, we have a non-zero denominator. Having, we have a non-zero denominator, we get a, a valid prediction of a wavelength. But somebody else comes along and says, you know what, a plus one half cycle phase shift is the same as a minus one half cycle phase shift. There's no physical difference between the two. It's just a convention. So if I wrote 2n2d over lambda minus negative a half equals m plus a half, I get 2n2d over lambda plus a half equals m plus a half. So the one halves cancel and I'm left with lambda equals 2n2d over m, whereas before I was 
I had lambda equals 2N2D over M plus 1. Well, now 0 is disallowed. Anybody have thoughts on how to interpret this or make sense of this? Any guesses? Anyone want to try? Well, m is an integer. So if I have m plus 1 in the denominator, I have some arbitrary integer. If I have m in the denominator, I have some arbitrary integer. All that these formulas are really telling you is that you have to have an integer in the denominator. And having 0 in the denominator never gives any physically valid predictions. All right, so whether we call it m or m plus 1 or m minus 1, um, if we had m minus 1 in the denominator, we could have set this up differently in that I could have put a 1 minus 1, I could have put minus minus a half here. And I could have said, you know, m minus a half, if m is 1, 2, 3, 4, m minus a half, is a half, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, et cetera. So I could have had plus a half minus a half. Then I subtract, this would be plus one half here. Subtract that off, I get m minus one. So I could have had m minus one in the denominator. And again, if m is an integer, m minus one is an integer. And we can have any integer we want in the denominator as long as it's an integer that gives a physically meaningful result. Infinite wavelength is not a physically meaningful result. Negative wavelength is not really a physically meaningful result unless we start interpreting it as, oh, we just flipped our ruler around. But it doesn't really make any physical difference. So when you solve a problem like this, you basically have to use some common sense for M. You have to think, what values could I put in that will give me something that is an actual number I can measure. Infinity is not a number I can measure, so I can't have 1 over 0. And if I start getting out negative numbers, does the fact that it's negative really mean anything? Well, a negative wavelength just means, if we think by convention that wavelength that goes from one peak to the next, peak here, peak to the right there, negative would basically mean I measured from right to left, but it's the same wave whether I measured this way or that way. So don't get too hung up on the M. Just use some common sense. Any questions on that? Anyone? Now, another case, sapphire is often used in uh, optics for its ability to withstand harsh conditions. Um, you won't see sapphire in consumer products because sapphire is expensive, but when I go to talks by defense contractors, they have a very different budget situation. And again, that's not solely because of the weirdness of government contracting, that's because when you're making something for 100 users, with special justifications for their budget. You can use different materials than you would do in a market for a million users. Um, but Sapphire is very good at withstanding heat, mechanical shock, acid. It's actually a really tough material. So people will sometimes do optics with Sapphire. They've got a high refractive index material. It'll give you very strong refraction when you want strong refraction. And it withstands harsh conditions. And we're going to learn a little bit that this is actually a great material to put on sapphire. And so again, we want to work out the wavelengths to give strong and weak reflectance. And it's the same condition as before. Even though we've changed some numbers, it's just like what we did with glass. We've got low index, intermediate index, high index. So a half cycle phase shift here a half cycle phase shift there, one half plus two n two d lambda over, sorry, two n two d over lambda minus a half set equal to 
an integer if you want, construct of interference, one and a half, or an integer plus a half if you want, destructive, and we get the same condition as before. Any questions? All right, one last case. Air, glass, air. So, low, high, low. Half cycle phase shift here, no phase shift there. 2N2D over lambda minus a half equals either M or M plus a half for destructive interference. And so the wavelength is 2N2D over M plus a half for constructive interference, or just 2N2D over M for destructive interference. Now, destructive interference of the reflection means very strong, very strong transmission. So the wavelength in the material, I could rewrite this by dividing both sides by N. Lambda over N would be the wavelength in the material. And that wavelength could be 2D, meaning twice the thickness. Or if I divide, if I make M equal two, it could just be the wavelength, so I fit a full cycle in there. Or I could fit one and a half cycles in there, or two and a half cycles in there. And so, in many cases, these strong reflections or strong transmissions, depending on how it was set up, will correspond to a wave that fits inside the layer. In your final answer there, yeah. you have lambda for deconstructive is 2N2D over M. You dropped the plus one because, again, in that case, it's just an arbitrary integer, and you can just do 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Well, yep. not, not zero in that case, of course. Yep. But, okay. Yep. M, M equals M plus one for these purposes. This is, this is kind of like in calculus where when you're doing indefinite integrals, you add, you just say that the indefinite integral is an antiderivative plus some constant C. And then in, many mathematicians will just go on. And again, if they start adding and subtracting things or making more changes, well, an arbitrary constant multiplied by anything is just another arbitrary constant. So you get, uh, you, you wind up getting the 2C equals C. And yes, as said in the group chat, rest in peace math majors. Uh, this is a good way to make a mathematician's head explode, except that some math professors are okay with saying the 2C equals C and C plus one equals C. All right, so back to anti-reflection coatings on glass. Um, we derived all of our conditions here, and we get that the thickness should be lambda over 2n2 multiplied by m plus a half. And I keep saying that we should choose m equals zero, or I guess if this were m minus a half, we choose m equals one. But either way, we want this thing in parentheses to be a half so that the thickness is lambda over 4n2. And one thing we could ask is why not 3 lambda over 4n2? So let's work through this in an example with numbers. If the wavelength were 600 nanometers, lambda over 4n2 would be 600 over 4 times 1.38. We get a number here. 600 nanometers is the wavelength we designed for. So we know we're gonna get very low reflectance there. We're gonna get stronger reflectance when we go away from that. So what's this wavelength here? Uh, well, we're gonna to have to figure out what wavelength gives a maximum. So we set 2N2D over lambda now equal to an integer instead of something shifted by a half from an integer. So we're going to get 300 nanometers here. All right. Now somebody comes along and says, you know what, I wanna use a different coding thickness. I wanna use three times this number. All right, well now we could calculate which wavelengths we're gonna get constructive interference at. And we're going to get uh, 2N2D 
over m or 2 times 1.38 times 326 over an integer. And if we do all that math, because we used the thicker coating, we are going to get uh, 900 nanometers over m. So we're going to get constructive interference not at 300 like we did with the thin film. We're going to get constructive interference at 900. Well, that's outside the visible, whatever. And 450, which is visible and closer to 600 than 300 was. So what happens is that when you use thicker films, it may seem strange, but when you use thicker films, the, um, the next wavelength is actually closer. And that's not such, the wavelength is closer and the spectrum is narrower, which seems kind of counterintuitive as long as we're talking about wavelength because we kept getting the thickness is proportional to wavelength. But let's think of it in terms of K values. I said before that we could rewrite all of these 2N, 2D over lambda conditions as 2D, the round trip thickness, multiplied by 2 pi N over lambda, which is just NK. And so you're going to get that 2D times K, depending on how we set things up, is either 2 pi M or 2 pi M plus a half. So in this case, for constructive, it's 2 pi m. For destructive, it's 2 pi m plus a half. So if I want to figure out how much k has to change so that I go from constructive to destructive, so that I go from minimum reflectance to maximum reflectance, well, I'll just subtract these. I get 2d times delta k is pi or delta k is pi over d. So if I have a small d, a very thin film, I get a very large spacing between k values. Whereas if we use a thick film, large value of d, then I get a small spacing between k values. And so that's how I think about um, why it is that thick films have their interference minima and maxima very close to each other. Any questions? So then could you use a thicker film to essentially block out like a really narrow region of wavelengths? Um, well, the thing is you would, there's a very narrow blocking range, but there would also be narrow, very narrow transmission range. And then immediately next to that transmission range, there'd be another very narrow blocking range. So if I were to, Switch devices so I can draw freehand. Give me a sec. Um, I'm going to share this screen. All right, if this is, uh, this is the thin film. Now here's the thick film. All right, and so because of that thick film, what you get is many, many transmitted wavelengths and many, many blocked wavelengths. And so if we think about the extreme limit of a window pane, something, you know, maybe half a centimeter thick, roughly, well, the K values that give constructive interference are so close together and so close to the ones that give destructive interference with the color resolution of your eye and the fact that you're sending a broad spectrum of light through there anyway, you just see um, an average transmittance. You don't see that some colors are strongly reflected and some are strongly transmitted. And so a situation, that generally this is a problem. Um, let me give you an example. If we have a very large laser cavity, 
All right, a laser cavity is just something where light bounces back and forth many times, getting amplified. And it keeps bouncing back and forth. And the idea is that there are two mirrors. One of these should have a reflectance that approaches one, as close to one as you can get to many decimal places. The other one has a reflectance that's still very high. You know, you might want thousands of passes, but not quite one. R equals one minus epsilon, some very tiny number. Well, wait, sorry, epsilon is what mathematicians use for tiny numbers, and we just uh, gave uh, heart attacks to all of the math majors, so we'll call it delta, right? Now, the trick is that for many types of lasers, L is much longer than the wavelength. It bounces back and forth many times, basically because they want very high amplification, so they want it to travel a long distance. And they also want, on the one hand, they want to take advantage of this, okay? They want delta K should be tiny. That way, the spectrum of light that's emitted in the end is very tiny, okay? The spectrum is very narrow. So on the one hand, they want a narrow spectrum. So you get huge amplification because you're traveling through a whole lot of amplifying medium and a very narrow line. Sounds great. The problem is that there are all of these other lines, which I'll draw in different colors. All right, and we need to somehow block all of these other lines. So what they do is, you know, they, they place something else in here, okay? They place something much thinner, which has a very large gap between the transmission resonances. Resonance just means interference phenomena involving things bouncing back and forth many times. They put something that has a very large gap. And when they put that thing that has a very large gap, that blocks out some of these lines and these lines and only leaves that line. And that way they can get one very, very pure line. And that's what people will do with lasers. Sometimes they don't care. Sometimes they're like, you know what, all of these lines are still very close to each other. All of these lines are around whatever wavelength we want. And for this experiment, we don't care if the wavelength is 514 nanometers or 514.1. We just don't care. Or we don't even care, for some experiments, people don't care if it gets, if the sample gets excited by both wavelengths, both by 514 and 514.1. For some experiments, it's inconsequential. For other experiments, that purity is absolutely essential. And so if that purity is absolutely essential, then they will put in something that blocks the light like that to, take, to select out all of these other wavelengths. And what they might actually do is, I've drawn this like that, but what they might actually do is insert it like this. There are still transmission resonances, but the transmission resonances are wider and the reflection resonances are wider. So anything that isn't at a transmission resonance gets reflected out. And by getting reflected out, they get rid of all that stuff within its first pass through the cavity. Any questions? Just a real quick thing. So you, you said um, that that block in the middle has what you called a large gap between transmission resonances. Yep. I didn't really understand that. Is that just saying that it has resonance with the specific uh, lambdas that you want, meaning that it amplifies those? Or think about it this way. If I imagine that 
um, this, let's say that this is the reflection of the thin block in there, okay? And this is the large cavity. What just happened? Um, go back. Oh, we don't know. Okay. So we want something. These are all of the wavelengths that bounce back and forth many times in the cavity. Okay. We want a wavelength that on the one hand bounces back and forth many times in the cavity. And here are all of the ones that do that. But on the other hand, we need a wavelength that is transmitted through the block, okay? And so all of these will bounce back and forth in the cavity, but only a few of them will be transmitted through the block. And so where those line up, this thin block is a way of selecting among all the things that will bounce back and forth in the cavity. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, now let's go back to sharing this screen. All right, so one thing we should talk about is why the half cycle phase shift? Well, let's think about, forget about thin films where we have three media, let's think about two media for now. All right, we've got a wave coming in, hitting an interface. The wave coming in has amplitude EI, it's polarized perpendicular to this direction. We'll deal with uh, the other case next time, next week. It's e to the i, n1, k0, x minus omega t. Well, some of it get tra gets, tra gets reflected. And the wave that gets reflected, first of all, the exponential has changed because k has just changed signs. It's now going to the left instead of to the right. I could write the amplitude, if I wanted, as the incident amplitude multiplied by some reflection coefficient. And I'm gonna call that R12 mean. It's a reflection in medium one off of medium two. We don't yet know what R12 is. We're gonna figure that out. There's some transmitted light, and that transmitted light, well, it's, the wave has a different uh, K value up there. It's N2K naught X minus omega T. And it has a transmission coefficient. We don't yet know what that is. We just know that whatever the amplitude of this is, the amplitude of the transmitted wave will be this amplitude multiplied by a transmission coefficient. All right, and we're gonna figure that out. Now, we have to figure that out by using the wave equation, using the fact that the field obeys this wave equation. And in the wave equation, there is a second derivative with respect to x. Now we need to resuscitate the math majors and bring them back in because now we have to care about all those continuity issues that your calculus professor harped on. Uh, you can't take the derivative if the function is discontinuous. You might be saying, well, shouldn't it be discontinuous at the interface? I mean, things change at the interface. Yeah, things change at the interface, but they should change smoothly, not via a jump. The index may have changed via a jump, but the field should change smoothly so that we can take its derivative. And if we can not just take a first derivative, but also take a second derivative, the second derivative is the first derivative of the first derivative. Well, you can't take the first derivative of something unless that thing is continuous. If I wanna take the derivative of the first derivative, then the first derivative had also better be continuous. That doesn't mean that the field everywhere on this side has to be equal to the field everywhere on that side, or that the derivative everywhere on this side has to equal the derivative everywhere on that side. But it does mean that if I write down a formula for the field, I could get a different value out here and out here, but if I plug in x equals zero, I better get the same value whether I use this formula, this combination of fields, or this formula. 
And likewise, if I calculate the derivative somewhere out here and I calculate the derivative somewhere out there, those two formulas can be different in most cases. But if I plug in x equals zero, I better get the same number from both formulas. And you may be thinking, well, on this side, which formula do I use? Is it the incident field that's uh, continuous or the reflected field? The answer is that the universe doesn't know, doesn't care, and neither does your detector. The field is the field. The field right here is the sum of this incident field and this reflected field. So here's the field on the left side. It's the sum of these two things. Here's the field on the right side. Here's the derivative. If I plug in x equals zero, all of those exponentials become much simpler. You know, the term in the exponent that had an x just goes away. So I'm left with e to the minus i omega t on both sides, and that cancels, as well as ei and z hat. And so I'm left with 1 plus r12 equals t12. And likewise, when I took the derivative, there were a bunch of i's and k naughts. Well, those go away because they're the same on both sides, so they cancel. But the n's are different on the both sides. And also, one of the terms gets a minus sign because k was negative there. So I get this pair of linear equations to solve. And I can solve them. I can go through the algebra. It's all written out here. And in the end, I get that the reflection coefficient is n1 minus n2 over n1 plus n2. Any questions on this procedure? Going once, going twice, sold. Okay. Well, so the amplitude of the reflected field is equal to the amplitude of the incident field multiplied by this expression. And this expression, R12, is negative if N1 is less than N2. All right, if the medium you start off in has a lower index than the medium that you reflect off of, then we've got a negative number here. And this explains where that comes from. This explains where that rule that you get a half cycle phase shift if you reflect off of a high index medium, that's where it comes from. It comes from this reflection coefficient. Any questions on that? All right, now I keep saying that people use magnesium fluoride. Uh, magnesium fluoride is actually not ideal. It's just that that turns out to be the best thing that's available. Um, we're gonna see that ideally you would want a refractive index that's the square root of 1.5 if, if you were using something that had an index of 1.5. So let's break this down into steps. You got an instant field, we're gonna call it amplitude one. Some of it gets transmitted with amplitude T12. Goes over to here, it's acquired a phase shift. I don't wanna keep writing out N2 K naught D, so I just say E to the I phi is E to the I N2 K naught D. Some of that stuff gets transmitted over here with transmission coefficient T23. And you're thinking, wait, we had formulas with one and two. Well, just take your formulas for T12 and R12, and to go to two, three, replace index one with index two and index two with index three. Meanwhile, some of it reflected here with amplitude R12. Well, here's our second reflection. It's T12, the amplitude coming in, multiplied by this phase shift. It had to get shifted like that to get here. Then it gets multiplied by R23. Then it travels this far. It acquires an additional phase shift. Then some of it gets transmitted with amplitude T21, R23, because it had to go from medium two to medium one. That's T21. It had reflection amplitude T R23 because it was in medium two reflecting off of medium three. It got this phase shift. And of course, there's more. Um, we could take into account the fact that uh, 
Some of this got reflected with amplitude R21 because it's in medium two reflecting off medium one. We could keep adding all of those up. And at each pass, each reflection, we get more factors of R21 and R23. So we keep multiplying by numbers smaller than one. And if we keep multiplying by numbers smaller than one, we're gonna get fractions of fractions of fractions, which get very small very quickly. So the first pass is an excellent approximation. But if you really wanted to do this exactly, you could. Um, you're gonna get an infinite series, but the infinite series has some patterns in it. Anybody who wants to simplify it for fun is welcome to do so, and I'm happy to talk about solving that puzzle by Zoom sometime if you want to. But in the meantime, we would get an excellent approximation if we just ignore all of those higher reflections. And you're saying, well, we're tossing out some reflections, so we're ignoring some of the reflected field. We must need to compensate for that somehow. Yeah, we're going to compensate for that by pretending that these transmission coefficients are one. So we're gonna slightly strengthen this term to compensate for all the terms we're leaving out. And you could say, well, that's, that's not rigorous. And I'd say, you're right. And we're gonna give an, a math major a heart attack. They're now in the ER being triaged to make sure they don't have COVID-19. Um, but in the meantime, it turns out to work. So, what we're left with is that R12, the reflection coefficient here, plus R23, the reflection coefficient there, plus this phase shift equals zero. And since these two things are real numbers, they only sum to zero if e to the 2i phi is one, is, sorry, minus one. So 2i phi must be pi times i, and 2 phi is going to be n2 times 2 pi d over lambda times 2. So we do all that cancellation. We get a thickness of lambda over 4 n2, which is just what we predicted before. So one of our heuristic rules from before comes out of still not an exact calculation, but something closer to exact. And r12 minus r23, that's only 0 if this is true. All right, that this reflection coefficient is equal to that reflection coefficient. Now here's the trick. I divide the top and bottom of the left by N2, and I divide the top and bottom of the right by N3. So I'm left with N1 over N2, the refractive index ratio on the left. And over here, everything depends on N2 over N3, the refractive index ratio on the right. I've got the same expressions, just with, the, just with some indices changed. Well, this is going to work if the input to this expression is the same on both sides, so that n1 over n2 equals n2 over n3. So cross multiply, and n2 squared is n1 n3, or n2 is the square root of n1 n3. So let's plug in n3 roughly 1.5. If we do that, we get that N2 should be about 1.22. All right, so that's what we would like to have if we wanted perfect anti-reflection. But finding mechanically tough materials that adhere to glass and have N equals 1.22, that's hard. We could make a porous material with N2 equals 1.22. It's so easy that even I could do it, and I'm a physicist. What I would do is I would make an organic, what's called an organosilicate, basically a precursor to silicon dioxide, something that once we let it dry out, um, is gonna undergo a reaction. We're gonna evaporate all the organic solvent and silicon dioxide will be left behind. And then I'm going to, with that, put in something, basically a polymer, basically a plastic. I'm gonna mix a plastic and silicon dioxide. And it's going to form a connected network of pores. Then I'm going to put that into an oven, and I'm going to burn out all of the plastic. So now I'm left with a mixture of, uh, now I'm left with porous silicon dioxide. And porous silicon dioxide, if I choose the porosity just right, so that's 50% air and 50% silicon dioxide, 
it's going to have the refractive index that I want. Problem is, that's going to be incredibly brittle. And that would be great if I put an anti-reflection coating on a lens that I keep in an isolated environment. But a lot of this stuff was developed in World War I to make um, coatings for the lenses that they used on bomber sites. So that's not going to work. We can't use something really brittle. Um, it turns out by trial and error that magnesium fluoride is a good compromise. Another thing I could do is I could probably find a plastic that does that, but there's no guarantee that that plastic will be terribly tough. And there's no, you might be thinking, well, there's plenty of plastic that's tough. All the consumer goods I buy are in really tough plastic packaging. Yeah, that's because they don't use any of the brittle plastics. They only use the tough plastics in the products you buy. So that's why they use um, magnesium fluoride. Among the available materials that will adhere to glass, it turns out to be the one that has an intermediate refractive index and adheres to glass and is reasonably mechanically tough. All right. Let's also figure out what R12 is. Well, it's roughly 0.2 if we just plug in the numbers. And if we square it, remember this is an amplitude coefficient. Intensity is the square of the field amplitude. So if we square it, we get 0.04, right? So we get about 4% reflectance, which is a good estimate for most types of glass. Any questions? Anyone? Okay, I think I'm gonna leave off the question of color change with angle until next time. What I wanna do is take a five minute break and then I want you to go into Python and use this um, program that I posted on Blackboard. If you didn't already download it and test it in Python, please do so now. We'll take about a five minute break. Um, it's going to be under course documents, thin film program. So about five minutes I'll come back and you should have Python open with that program and we're going to talk about how it works.
Okay, my clock says it's been five minutes. So here's what this program does. This program calculates the reflection and transmission of light through multi-layer thin films. Now, I didn't design a nice graphical user interface for it. But one thing you're gonna learn in science is that graphical, nice graphical user interfaces are usually expensive. So you often wind up borrowing code from people who just wrote things that you have to edit either within the code itself or in a text file. And if I were to, the next change I would probably make to this is to put everything into a text file. So a few things that you have to change, and I spell out in the comments what you change. Now, for those who don't know Python, anything that has a pound sign in front of it, that is a, um, that is a comment. It says here, start of the section that you can edit. There's a few commands, true or false, what do you want it to, to plot? I have it plotting right now transmittance, sorry, reflectance and the field. You also have to pick the mode that you want it to operate in because there are many ways that you could uh, play with variables. One thing you could do is, and I'm gonna switch back to my other device, which I had to restart for unrelated reasons. So I'm gonna switch back to my other device. One thing you could do is, and now I'm getting feedback for my other device. I'm going to disconnect that audio. And hang on a sec. Share this screen. Well, there are many things that we could do. One thing we could do is we could do an experiment where we fix the angle that it's coming in at. All right, so I'm just gonna, oops, wrong one. Great, now it's opening Mathematica on this device. Hang on, sorry. Quit that. Okay, so if you look at mode zero, fix the angle of incidence, vary the wavelength and evenly spaced steps. Here's what that means. That means that you send in all of the light at some fixed angle, all right? And you vary the wavelength. So first you send in maybe uh, blue light, okay? You send in blue with a narrow wavelength. And then you send in something with a somewhat longer wavelength. So green. And then you send in something with an even longer wavelength. So red, okay? So this would be mode one. You fix that. Fix theta. Mode zero. Theta. Sorry, mode zero, yeah. Mode zero. Uh, mode zero. Mode one is very similar. You fix theta. But then instead of going from a minimum wavelength to a maximum wavelength over some number, 
you go through a list of wavelengths. So if I switch back to um, my device that has the Python code in it, if you look at mode one, it looks very similar, except that you have a list. And there's no reason, if you go from 0.4 to 0.7 in evenly spaced steps, then it's gonna go, well, whatever, 300 nanometers divided by 1,000. It's gonna go 400 nanometers, 400.3, 400.6, 400.9, yada, yada, yada. But maybe you, for, for a certain experiment, there's only a handful of wavelengths that you care about and maybe they're not evenly spaced. So in that case, you could just type in a list of whatever wavelengths you want. I mean, to give one very concrete example, um, if I were to use a certain laser that I used to use all the time in grad school, maybe I would only care about these two wavelengths. Those were two of the main wavelengths that I could produce with that laser. So then I might only use uh, those two numbers in there. And again, we can fix the angle. And the angle you type in down here. If I want normal instance, I put zero. Now you may be saying, why am I multiplying by pi over 180? Um, Python likes its angles in radians. And so I just always put the pi over 180 there as a multiplicative factor. Zero times pi over 180 is still zero, so it won't matter there. But later on, if I decide that I want some other angle, as a human being, I still think in degrees just because it's what I used when I was first forming my intuition of the world. Um, and then I just multiply by pi over 180. Uh, but you can put in whatever numbers you want. Now, modes two and three would be very similar. You fix the angle of incidence and you vary k all right now you still type in wavelengths but then what it does is it plays with the k values now the subtle difference there is that k is 2 pi over lambda so if your k values are evenly spaced your lambda values won't quite be evenly spaced they'll be almost evenly spaced but not quite evenly spaced all right, and there are certain types of experiments where you want your k values evenly spaced. So for those, I allow that. Um, and then I also allow you to vary k in some user-defined manner. The other mode that you're gonna use a lot is mode four, where you vary the angle and fix the wavelength. So the way to visualize that would be, let me switch to a drawing. If we're in mode four, we fix the color and we vary the wavelength. Sorry, we fix the color and vary the angle. All right, we fix the wavelength and vary the angle. So theta equals zero, theta one, theta naught is greater than zero, theta one is greater than zero, theta two is greater than theta one, theta three is greater than theta two. All right, that's another common type of experiment that people want to do. And then if for some reason you wanted to not change your angle in even steps, but rather only consider a few very specific angles, that would be mode five. But we're not gonna use mode five very much. We're mostly gonna use mode zero and mode four. Now, it's also going to give you a plot of the electric field inside the system. And you have to, or can give you a plot of the electric field inside the system. So you have to decide what angle and wavelength you want it to use. Because you, know, you might do a thousand cases. You get a spectrum for that thousand cases. And then you want to look at the field as one particularly important or representative case. You tell it what wavelength to plot and what angle to plot. 
The final thing you have to give it is some information on the uh, system itself, okay? So we need to tell it the medium on the left and the right, and then we need to give it some, um, some coding layers. All right, so let's try to visualize this. Um, Here's left medium. Here's where the light starts out at whatever angle or angles that you specify. Here's the right medium. And these are both infinite media. They don't, they don't have any thicknesses. You know, these just go out to infinity. But then here, are finite layers. And for each of these layers, you have to give a thickness and a wavelength. So D0, N0, D1, N1. Um, and there, I'm indexing them from zero because Python starts its lists um, from zero, all right? And you can decide how many of these you want. But this is the geometry, this is how to think about the geometry, okay? These are the types of variables that you need to specify. Now I've set it up so that for n, you can either give it a number. You could just say, hey, uh, 1.38 or 2.1 or whatever. Or if you've defined a function that gives the uh, refractive index versus wavelength, if you have defined function name with wavelength as an input, and I did that for two materials. I'm not going to ask you to define any other functions, but you know, if you want to use this for something else, I'm making this freely available for any use you want. So if you wanted to um, define a function for some material that you're working with, you could do that. In that case, all you have to do is put in the name of that function. And I've actually got something in the code that will, um, I'll show you where that is. Not that you're gonna have to do that yourself, but, Let's see, where is that? Um, search, find text, uh, type. All right, where is it? Where is it? I'm not seeing it. If type of n, so if the type, when it's checking the refractive index, if it's a number, then it goes with a number. If it's a, uh, if it's not a uh, number, then it, okay, I see. So if the type is a string, then it will evaluate that function, okay? So if the type is a string, then it will evaluate that function. And now I am trying to figure out where it actually does that. It's been too long. If that type is a string, Oh, I see. Whoa, whoa, that is not what I intended. 
I'm just going to close that without saving the changes, and then I'm going to reopen it. And open recent. Okay, so if the type is a float, I think it's done by an else statement. Anyway, you know what, we'll, let me try one other thing. Get index, let's go into the get index function. Nope. Get, ah. All right. If it's callable, ah, there it is. If it's callable, if it's something that's callable, then it takes that if it takes the index and it tries to call it as a function. And if your index is 1.47, well, that's not a function. But if your index was the name of a function available up there, like SIO2 or TA205, then it works with that. But that was very much an unnecessary aside, I apologize. Okay. So, what I've given you here is a bunch of um, test cases, right? And we can run any of these test cases by uncommenting things. So there's the left medium index, there's the right medium index, and then there's the coding layers, all right? And the coding layers, is a list of lists. In Python, a list is a bunch of items that are inside square brackets. And if I have one layer, well, okay, there's a list of layers, and each layer is itself a list. In that it, each layer is a list that has a thickness and an index, all right? And, um, And so each layer has to be in square brackets. So let's test this, okay? Let's uh, say we've got the case of, um, and I left out some information for this test case. So let's ignore that test case. Let's go to test case two. Test case two is calibrated to give perfect transmission at a wavelength of 0.55 microns for both polarizations at an incident angle of 45 degrees if the left medium index and right medium index are both one, all right? So let's do that. Let's put this in mode zero. And let's go 45 degrees, because it said that this test case should work for 45 degrees, all right? This was all optimized for 45 degrees. So we go to mode zero, 45 degrees, wavelengths between 0.4 and 0.7, that will encompass the 0.55 where this test case is supposed to work. Now it says left medium index and right medium index should both be one. So let's do that, and in general, I put 1.0 because sometimes Python gets weird with integers versus floats. It sh the code should be written so that doesn't matter, but it's always good practice to not tempt fate, to not tempt fate that maybe you left out one little thing somewhere where it is gonna matter. All right, so let's do that. What we've got is we've got something
whose thickness is this complicated expression and whose index is 1.5. And so when we've got all of that set up, then we go and we hit run file. And the way Spider is, it always checks a few things with you the first time you run things. You can uncheck that. Before you that. do that, comment test case four so you're not doing that one in addition. Ooh, good catch. Yes, we need to undo test case four. All right, thank you for catching that. All right, now you don't see anything, but that's because you're not looking at the plots window. So if I go up here, and look at the plots window, I see two plots. One is a field profile. And it has the field versus position for two different polarizations of light. And it also has the refractive index. It's plotted a graph of refractive index, so that the refractive index is one outside of all of this to the left and one to the right and in between it's 1.5 and it's 1.5 between zero and two and we can verify that's correct by looking at coding layers now when we specified coding layers that list i wrote it out as this complicated expression because that's how we would calculate it basically we want to have wavelength over two times the index, and then this extra thing here is due to coming in off axis, we'll deal with that next time. We wrote that as an expression. Python evaluated all of that to a number, 0.207, yada, yada, right? And indeed, we see that the, fia, that the uh, excuse me, the index, is 1.5 between x equals zero and x equals roughly 0.2, which matches up with what we see down here. If I select the other graph, I see a graph of reflectance versus wavelength. And I see that for one of the polarizations, the reflectance dips pretty sharply at 0.55. It's definitely, um, it is definitely minimized for that uh, polarization. For the other polarization, it's also minimized, but it's on a much flatter background. And that has to do with the difference between TE and TM. For now, we're gonna treat the TM polarization as curiosity. On next Thursday's assignment, you're gonna derive an interesting fact about TM polarization, but I'll give you a brief overview now so that it's not completely a mystery. All right, so if TE versus TM polarization. So here's a surface. Here's a light wave hitting the surface. Here's a light wave reflecting off. And then here's the transmit. So incident reflected transmitted, right? Well, for that field, there are two different ways, the electric, for that wave, there are two different ways that the electric field could be um, oriented. It could be oriented so that the electric field is um, transverse, right? It could be oriented so that the E field is coming out of the screen. All right, which means that it is transverse. It is perpendicular to the plane that contains all three of these waves. Transverse or perpendicular to the plane containing all three waves. And if that's the case, then um, the magnetic field, which I'll draw in a different color, 
is going to be All right, so this is the TE case. This is the transverse electric field, transverse E. Now, there's another case, which is the transverse magnetic field. Again, we have our incident, we have our reflected wave, and we have our transmitted wave. But now we have that the E field is in the plane, okay? And the B field is out of the plane. So now B is transverse to the plane containing all three wave directions. Or the K vectors. Right, and these different waves satisfy different boundary conditions. It turns out the reflectance of TM waves is actually uh, very complicated. And reflectance of TM waves tends to be weak. As a matter of fact, TM waves have the remarkable property that, um, that for a special angle, they can be transmitted with 100% efficiency, zero reflectance, okay? There's no angle at which, okay, there are for multi-layer films, but it turns out that even if we just have two media, so no coding, no interference phenomena, TM waves, there's a special angle where TM waves can be transmitted with 100% efficiency, and you're gonna work that out next week. There is no such angle if you have TE waves and just one interface. So what you need to take away right now is the TM waves often exhibit really weak reflectance. And this is actually why polarizing sunglasses are so useful. Because TM waves are usually weakly reflected, most of the reflected light that you see is TE. So if you have a polarizing filter on your sunglasses, oriented to reflect TE waves coming off of the ground, so that you don't see glare from the sidewalk, you don't see glare from the hood of a car, you don't see glare from any horizontal objects, like say, um, like say the ocean, all right? Especially the ocean when the sun is low in the sky. Polarizing sunglasses can be good to wear at the beach because if the sun is really low in the sky, then of course it's sunset or sunrise and the light is fairly weak. But if you know it's four in the afternoon in the summer, then it's low enough in the sky that you're getting some glare coming at you, not so low that it's sunset. And most of the stuff reflecting off of the horizontal surface will be TE. So this is why people often wear polarizing sunglasses because a lot of the glare off of horizontal objects is TE because TM light is so weakly reflected. For now, we're just gonna take that as a given though. We're just gonna take it as a given. The TM light is often weakly reflected. And what you should take away if nothing else right now is that this code works because when we did a graph of reflectance versus wavelength for an incident angle of 45 degrees, which means we're working in mode zero because we fix the angle, vary the wavelength, angle's 45 degrees, we got minimized reflectance at a 45, at 550 nanometers or 0.55 microns. Now the description of this, any questions on what we did so far? I have one, uh, yeah. particularly on the, uh, the TE and the TM. Yeah. When you drew the, the pictures as you did, 
like in the first one, T, you said E is out of the screen. Yeah. Since B is perpendicular to E inside of an EM wave, wouldn't that mean that B is literally like in the plane of the wave? Exactly. Kind of? Okay, okay. I, was, I just wasn't getting that from the drawing. I was just kind of like, yeah, but okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So B is in the plane here, and um, B is in the plane, and E is out of the plane here. E is in the plane, B is out of the plane. And the TM waves generally reflect weakly. All right. So let's go back to the code. Now, when I described that test case, I also said that this was all optimized so that we would get Brewster transmission, which for now all you need to know is a word for perfect transmission at 56.3 degrees for TM light. Okay, so if we're gonna vary the wavelength, sorry, vary the angle and fix the wavelength, now we need to go to mode four. And let's see, it looks like we're doing this for a wavelength of 55.55 microns. We're going between minus 80 and plus 80. We're gonna switch it to mode four. And let's try running. All right, now it helps to undock this. So let's do that. All right, and what we get is that at 45 degrees, okay, we said that we're gonna get destructive interference of the reflected light for 45 degrees in 0.55 microns. Indeed, at 45 degrees down here, it looks like both of them go to a zero. Um, I haven't yet figured out all of the zoom tools for um, spider, but so far I'm unimpressed. Canopy was better. I don't know why they're not supporting it. We also got, um, it said that we should get perfect transmission or zero reflectance at 56.3. And that looks plausible. So um, let's, let's test that. Let's go staying in mode four. Let's just go from, ooh, I don't know. Uh, if I want to look around 56.3, let's go from 50 times pi over 180 to 60 times pi over 180 and see what happens. And for the TM waves, it looks like, see, we can't, I have not yet figured out the zooming features in here. They are not as nice as the ones that we had in Canopy. But it is at least plausible that we are seeing uh, zero reflectance around 56.3, because it does look like there is a dip somewhere around here. Any questions? I'm kind of not really seeing what you're talking about. You're saying that we have perfect reflectance at 56.3. Perfect transmission. Perfect transmission. Yeah. I mean, it's, the reflectance is essentially zero everywhere along here. It's plausible if I stare at it. I don't have the zoom tools in here that I had in uh, Canopy. And I don't I mean, know a about percentage up there you can look at. What? The percentage at the top of the graph, the 131 right there. Uh, percentage. Oh, this zoom. Yeah, but watch. Um, let's well, here. You'll see. All right, let's go to 500. Oh nope, it's not letting me do that in here. I have to undock it. All right. Now, 
See, it has to do with how I change the size of the screen. And it's just magnifying a low res figure. Okay. I might be switching back to Canopy, but um, anyway, it's passing the test cases. So what you're gonna be doing, if you wanna look at more than one layer, let's, let's just go to the assignment, right? Let's just go into next week's assignment. So I have you work on polycarbonate. And honestly, the reason why I have you make coatings for polycarbonate, besides the fact that polycarbonate is used in eyeglasses, is that I found a nice readable patent for anti-reflection coatings on polycarbonate. And I figured it would be very instructional to um, read an actual patent. And so I figured, okay, if I have a very nice, readable, easy to understand patent, for coatings on polycarbonate, then I should make the rest of the assignment about polycarbonate as well. So first I have you just put one layer on polycarbonate. And so all you would do to put one layer on polycarbonate is you could comment out these test cases or use one or edit one of these test cases, however you want to do it. But one way or another, you would just say coding layers, that underscore is important. Coding layers equals, I don't know, 0 0.1 and whatever the refractive index was, 1.41 or let's see. Um, they tell you to use SiO2 and they tell you to put it on polycarbonate. So 1.59 is the right medium, polycarbonate. SiO2 is the coding. Right now I'm just gonna guesstimate a uh, coding, a layer thickness of 0.1. And then we will switch to a mode where we can look at reflectance versus wavelength. Now, in the assignment, what angle did it say to uh, design for? Normal incidence, so that's got to be zero. So we do that. And you know what, we've got a whole bunch of these open. I look at that, and that's not quite what I wanted. We need a different coding thickness to get minimum transmission, uh, sorry, minimum reflection at 0.55. But that's the basic idea, all right? Now, later on in the assignment, it says, hey, somebody points out that when you deposit, uh, somebody points out that when you deposit silicon dioxide, on polycarbonate, you get this thin layer in between. So now we're gonna to have to have two coating thickness, two layers, okay? We're gonna have a layer of SiO2, and then right next to it, we're gonna have a layer with a thickness that we're gonna to have to play with. We'll start with you know, 50 nanometers and see what happens and a refractive index that uh, is specified in the assignment, and we just see what happens. And I'm not gonna go into this too much. Your, your task on the assignment is to interpret this. For now, I just wanna show you what, hap what you do in order to put two layers into a system. We still have air on the left. We still have polycarbonate on the right. We still have our main layer of SiO2, and then we have this porous layer with a thickness that we're playing with to try to see what happens, and an index specified in the assignment. Any questions?
Okay, then I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, you still have the modulation transfer function assignment to finish for Tuesday. The thin film assignment is for the following Tuesday. Next Tuesday at the beginning of class, please do log in on time because we're going to have a visit from alum Kyle Haddock, who graduated two years ago and now works at Opto Sigma, a uh, global manufacturer of optical components. And he actually does a lot of his work on thin film coatings. And so he's going to talk about what he does as an optical engineer in the private sector working on thin films. Uh, after that, we'll talk about reflection at, oh, sorry, we'll talk about thin films at off normal angles, what happens when we change the angle of instance. We saw that uh, qualitatively here. We're going to go into the theory behind it. And then we'll talk about some different designs for multi-layer films that accomplish certain tasks. And then the following day, uh, next Thursday, we're going to talk about um, the theory behind this code, the method that you would use if you're not just talking about one coding, but some arbitrary number of coding layers and the matrix calculations that are driving this code. Have a good day. I'm gonna end here because it's almost the end of class time.